our mission and our goal is that by the end of today, you will walk away with at least, hopefully a lot more, but at least one action item uh, that you can take care of in your practice today. With that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, who is Stephen Nance. Stephen Nance has um, been with us for five years, and he um, start, came to us uh, as a, he was a state auditor before. And so I will give him the opportunity uh, to um, take that away. Are you? Yep. Ready? All right. Yep, I'm here. Thank you, Heather. Um, it's good to be with you today. Uh, I know you're in a crisis. We all are. Uh, the dental industry has been hit uh, at least as hard, if not harder, than anyone else right now, where you're having to close your doors except for emergencies. Um, I'm going to share um, a presentation with you here. Um, let's talk about your cash flow. Uh, this is on your minds, I know. So you've been operating where money has been coming in uh, whenever you've had pr production. Uh, now that faucet has been turned off and you have maybe some pennies trickling in compared to the dollars that you're used to and that you need to survive here. And meanwhile, your, your expenses don't go away. So this is a time, a critical time, uh, as you know, where uh, um, if you're not careful, you can lose everything that you've worked for. And I don't want to be overly pessimistic here, but it's also an opportunity where if you can manage this time and come out ahead, you'll be better off for it. So let's look at cash flow and what you can do. Uh, so first of all, you need to understand how much cash you have, not just the dollar amount that's in your bank right now, but how long that will last you uh, under current operations um, with doing nothing. And then we're going to, going to look at what we can do to increase funds available to you so you can increase that cash in your bank account. And then what can you do to retain what is in there? And the most important part of this is this first step here, understanding how much cash you have and how long that's going to last you. You need to be in a position, I'm going to recommend, where your cash can last you at least two to three months. And we don't know how long this crisis is going to last. If you can push that longer, six months, great. Uh, but you need to have at least two to three months. If you're not there yet, we're gonna help you get there so that you can stay in business and come out of this ahead. So let's look at increasing cash collections. First thing is, are all your claims submitted? You have time, make sure all the claims are submitted so you can start getting some cash in the door. Uh, second of all, any unpaid accounts, accounts receivable. Uh, you want to approach this delicately, but again, you have some time where you could be making some patient phone calls, understand that they may be hurting too, just as much as you are, but they may not be. So you don't want to prejudge either way, but it's a good opportunity to make some calls, starting with rapport, checking in, how are things going, getting a feel for if they're going to be able to pay you. Uh, you have earned this money, so you have the right to be able to collect on it. But you do want to approach it sensitively, for sure. You don't want to push people away, but uh, anything you can do to collect what you've earned, all the better. Um, if you have an insurance policy that can cover a disaster or a crisis like this, uh, definitely want to make a call to your insurance company and see what you can do to, to get that. Um, if you have some personal funds, now is a time to cut back on your personal spending restaurants, travel, entertainment, things like that. And if you are falling into that group where you may be getting some of the stimulus money, um, any personal funds you have available um, that you can contribute to the business, it might be more, more worthwhile to cut back on personal spending and put it into your business right now. 
uh, to keep things afloat, keep things going, um, obviously. And then uh, let's look at debt financing, lines of credit. We're going to be talking more about this subject later, but um, check what's available. There's new programs. We still don't have all the details of this new SBA program, but they're pretty, uh, they're pretty generous. Um, and you want to look into what's available to you, get some funds in this. Yes, it's a loan. You're going to have to pay it back eventually, but not necessarily all of it as we'll talk about uh, later. So let's so look at what is available to you there. Um, and I put this last, but you have the option if you have a 401k to uh, take a loan out of your 401k or even an early distribution. I put this last on purpose because I wouldn't want to do this. I would want to do this as a last resort because that's your retirement. But if you need to get some money into your business to keep it alive, it's worth knowing that you can do that because uh, it's a crisis right now, as, as we know. So once we get as much money into the business as we can, into your bank account, uh, what is there um, is, is important. Now, going back to that first thing that I told you about, how the most important part is understanding what you have available right now. I was looking at a client um, that has 220000 in their bank account, which you look at that and you think, they're going to be just fine. But then I look at what they're spending on average per month. They're spending about 175000 per month uh, in their operations. It's not wasteful spending. It's just what their business has been costing them. So uh, that if they're not careful and they don't manage things right, that 220000 is going to um, be gone fast. So we want to make that last as long as possible. The big one that's on all your minds is payroll. What do you do with your employees? Um, do you lay them off? Do you furlough them? Do you keep paying them? I have, I, I know a dentist that is, is full steam ahead. The, the office is closed except for emergencies, but they're paying all their employees as if nothing happened, as if they're still working 100%. Um, they, they did that right from the beginning with the idea that when this is all over, a lot is going to be expected of them. And having that uh, benefit to your employees to keep them uh, is going to be valuable if you can afford it. For a lot of you, that's, that's not really an option. You need to look at cutting your costs where you can. And for the most part, um, if you furlough or cut back on the hours of your employees, they can still get the unemployment benefit. Uh, so, Again, what's most important here is what's your cash situation? How long is your cash going to last you? Um, and that will determine which option you have to go with. You ought to be aware also of the new uh, employer mandates for sick leave and expanded FMLA. So uh, you're now required to pay sick leave at 100% of the employee's normal pay for anyone who's impacted by the coronavirus, um, whether they get it or they need to take care of a family member. Um, and then after two weeks, uh, you're, you're required to pay up to two weeks. And then after that, there's uh, expanded FMLA where if an employee has to stay home to take care of a child because either they have the coronavirus or they're home from school because the school's closed, under this current crisis, you're required to pay them at two thirds of their normal pay for up to 10 more weeks. So up to 12 weeks total, you're required to pay this sick leave or expanded FMLA. Now, the good news is if you have less than 50 employees, you are entitled to an exemption. There's supposed to be an application form coming. We haven't seen that yet, but you are allowed, a, you are allowed an exemption from that requirement. But if you choose to go ahead and pay it and offer that sick leave benefit, you're entitled to a tax credit. That will be a credit that will be against your payroll taxes. So it'll be on your next quarterly payroll tax filing. And, and essentially the government's reimbursing you for this. So it's, it's costing you a little bit up front, but it, in the end, you're gonna be made even. So that's an option. Again, understand your cash situation, understand the options available to you. Uh, we'll talk more specifically and more about team options here a little bit later, 
but that's the first thing you want to look at in what you can do to hold on to as much cash as you can. The next thing is loan payments and leased equipment. It's worth making a phone call to your bank or to your leasing company to see what options they can give you. Can they delay a payment? Can they give you a month off? Uh, what other terms can they work out for you under this current crisis? It doesn't hurt to ask. The worst they can do is say nothing. They can't do anything. Um, but it's worth making a call and seeing what they can do for you. Same thing with rent and utilities. Make a call to your landlord, to the utility company, see what they can do to work out an arrangement to, to defer paying as long as possible. Supplies and equipment. Obviously now it's not the time to be investing a lot in equipment and supplies. You don't wanna pay for anything you don't need right now. And right now you don't need a whole lot because you are essentially not open. Um, but on the other hand, again, going back to your specific cash flow analysis, um, what, what you have available to you, if there's some discounts um, going on right now with some of the supply companies. So it may be worth it to take advantage of some of those discounts if you have the cash flow available and you know you're going to need that in the future. But if not, you want to cut back as much as possible, obviously. And most of you have cut back on travel. That's uh, definitely not essential right now. Uh, taxes, we all know of the extended deadline, July 15th. As an accountant, I was less than thrilled when I heard about this, because that means my tax season is now extended through July 15th. But this is a gift to you. This is gonna help you out if you owe taxes. You don't need to pay them in April anymore. You've got three extra months to pay them and that is that can be extremely helpful for you. Uh, so I'd encourage you to uh, not pay until July 15th. And that includes your first quarter uh, 2020 estimated tax payments too. So your 2019 and your first quarter 2020 estimated taxes can now be deferred until July 15th. That's a big gift. If you are due a refund, get your taxes filed now so you can get that money. Um, if you have some automatic payments um, that are non-essential right now, uh, see if you can cancel those and hold on to your money as long as possible. So uh, those are kind of the basics. Cash is king. Remember, um, whatever you can do to, to keep the cash flow in your business, that's going to uh, control your business. We know the saying, a fool and his money will soon be parted. You're not a fool. You're a victim of a very unfortunate circumstance right now. Uh, but again, you've got to manage this appropriately so that you can pull through. And I, I believe that if you take the time now to manage this wisely and you learn the principles or take the principles that you learn from this experience and apply them in better times ahead, you're going to be so much more better for it. So um, uh, that's, that's what I have, Heather. Uh, thanks. Okay, so if you have any questions about what you just heard about, go ahead and pop them into the Q&A or the chat. Um, we're monitoring both. Um, and we do have one question. I believe that we're going to cover this in, by our next speaker, Ed Gabriel. Um, but the question is, um, how do I apply for an exemption? Stephen? Oh, the question, how do you apply for the exemption? So there is no, um, there's no form right now. So right now, if you have less than 50 employees, first of all, on the FMLA side, there actually is no application requirement. You're, you get that automatically. For the, the sick leave part, um, there's no form right now. So document, uh, keep a record, keep a mental note, uh, until that form comes up, uh, we, when that does come to fruition, know that uh, you'll probably need to file something. But for now, you're entitled to that exemption. So uh, you should be good for now. Ed has been with us for 10 years, and he is a very experienced um, CPA who's been through a few of these economic times of travail 
and he's going to talk to us about uh, unemployment as well as some other things that has been going on. Um, so please, Ed, take it away. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this uh, health crisis is forcing you into some very tough decisions in an uncertain environment. Uh, we know that your teams are important and critical to your success, and hopefully our discussion today will give you some clarity. Uh, there will still be questions to work out office by office uh, based on your particular situations and needs, and we'll do our best to help you through this. One of the challenges here is that there are lots of different sources of information. I'm going to take a little bit deeper dive into some of the FMLA, uh, the Medical Leave Act, that, than Steve did. Uh, which hopefully will clarify some things, but may also raise some additional questions. Um, but the main decision for employees out of work is going to be, should I do sick leave or am I forced to do sick leave or should I do unemployment? Now this will vary state by state because of the various state unemployment rules. But uh, basically the sick leave question is, is a mandate. If people are affected by the COVID virus directly, then uh, they have some sick leave benefits that are being uh, mandated by the government. I will mention that the first 10 days of leave is actually does not have to be paid and an employee may elect or an employer may require an employee to substitute any accrued paid vacation leave, personal leave or medical or sick leave uh, for that unpaid leave. And generally uh, the act provides for, as Steve mentioned, the uh, two weeks of paid sick leave uh, it's at the regular rate of pay if the person is directly affected by COVID, if they have it, if they're quarantined, or they're, they have a, need a medical diagnosis for it. And then people are at 80 hours at two-thirds of their pay if they're unable to work because of a need to care for an individual subject to quarantine or to care for a child whose school is closed, for example. And this is probably where most of our uh, dental clients will be affected with uh, assistance or hygienists that need to be at home to care for children. Um, and then there's an additional up to 10 weeks of paid or expanded family and medical leave at two thirds of the employee's rate um, if they have to leave to care for a child. Now the limited exemption, I did a little bit more research into this. And here's a quote from the DOL website. Small businesses with fewer than 50 employees may qualify for exemption, for exemption from the requirement to provide leave due to school closings or childcare unavailability if the leave requirements would jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. Uh, we don't know at this point what the threshold for viability will be. Now, if you do pay sick leave, there is that 100% credit uh, I understand that it's against the employer portion of FICA and that any excess will be refundable and we'll need to get more details on that. They're not available yet. Uh, also, if you decide that you may, if you have to pay some of that sick leave and you're thinking, well, I, I don't want to pay these payroll taxes right now, they're going to waive penalties for payroll deposits that are late in anticipation of the sick pay credit. Uh, they've also noted that there's no FICA tax on the sick pay, so it'll just be regular pay, no payroll taxes on that. So let's take a common scenario uh, in this question of should I do sick pay or unemployment. So let's say that an, an assistant has some small kids at home and the husband is still working. She makes, let's say, $18 an hour or $720 a week. Her sick pay would be two-thirds of the wages or $480 a week. If I pay her that 480 for 12 weeks, it's fully refundable by the federal government, although it might take many months to get that cash flow back to me. On the other hand, if I furlough her for unemployment, the state pays 126th of her quarterly wages, which would be about $355 for up to 26 weeks, plus the federal government is probably going to be matching that 355 so she's gonna get a total of $710 a week for up to four months under the federal guideline. So in this particular situation, the business probably would have better cash flow and the employee would have more cash. Uh, There's still a lot of details to come. And the law that was passed uh, by the Senate yesterday has not been passed by the House yet. That'll probably happen tomorrow. So jumping over now to unemployment, 
Uh, with respect to unemployment benefits, uh, the states are responding with a relaxation of benefits, which is in accordance with federal guidelines. Some of you may have already let people go and are on reduced schedules, and some are concerned about contracted associates. Uh, our message here is that the unemployment landscape is really pretty friendly to your situation. Uh, the COVID response may not be readily apparent on your state's unemployment homepage. Uh, in some cases, looking at different states, I had to search for COVID-19 or for coronavirus to get the updated information for that state. Uh, the Senate bill, which passed last night, increases state unemployment benefits by up to $600 a week for four weeks. And the coverage is expanded to cover self-employed persons and independent contractors like dental associates. Uh, the House still needs to approve it, as I mentioned. Uh, the bill revises the SBA program, allowing for loan forgiveness for proceeds used for payroll, uh, but you need to maintain employment levels in order to do it. They've mandated a coverage period from March 1 to June 30th, uh, and it suspends the rule that loan forgiveness is taxable income. So this leads to the question, uh, should I furlough employees and have them take unemployment or keep them and apply for a loan? Um, my argument for unemployment would be that unemployment comp carries zero FICA payroll taxes to begin with for both you and your employees. Uh, you would not be paying any loan interest. There's no loan application process, no loan forgiveness calculations later on. Um, if you've already furloughed employees since March 1, then you'll be getting less than 100% loan forgiveness for payroll expenses because they're comparing this March to June to last year's March to June. And if you've got fewer employees in payroll now, you're going to get less than 100% loan forgiveness. And just to take a note, um, some congressmen initially opposed this bill as being too generous, since your employees could make more than they normally would. Uh, additionally, the Senate bill includes a tax credit advance of $1,200 per adult and $500 per child on top of these unemployment benefits. Uh, bottom line is that your employees should be okay with unemployment levels that are being offered and, and the subsidies from the federal government assuming the office closures don't last too long. So let me just compare uh, unemployment rules before and after COVID. So normally, unemployment requires an eligibility requirement. You have to have a work history. Usually in Utah, at least, it's five quarters. That really hasn't changed. Uh, benefits are based on your wage history with a $580 per week Utah maximum benefit. Um, of course, now with COVID, we've got some supplemental federal benefits on top of that. Uh, the benefits are generally paid weekly. In Utah, the week begins on Sunday and ends on Saturday night at midnight. Uh, there's a one-week wait in Utah, and that's probably going to be the same even under the COVID um, crisis. Uh, generally, um, before this crisis, the claimants were not eligible if there was any work or even any paid, in, uh, paid instruction for that week. Those rules have now been relaxed. And there's even eligibility for unemployment if the employer temporarily shuts down uh, or even if the hours are just reduced. So where it used to be you couldn't have any compensation for that week and, and still get benefits, now you can. Uh, the other critical thing uh, in my mind was that claimants in the past had to conduct a job search in Utah, you had to put in four applications per week in order to claim your benefits. Uh, but they're now waiving that requirement, which means that as a dental office, you should be able to retain your team even if they're out uh, on unemployment. And general, generally, it's going to take about uh, two to three weeks uh, to get um, your first check from the unemployment office. And that's true both before and after COVID. Uh, one of the concerns employers have is that in the past, uh, there's two rates that come with unemployment. There's a base rate that the state mandates, and then there's an employer rate, usually based on how much unemployment an employer has. Um, in Utah, they've stated that the benefit costs attributable to COVID-19 will be charged to social costs, meaning the base tax rate, and will not affect the employer's experience rating which is a good thing for employers. 
Um, another question you might have is whether officers can apply, whether the dentist himself can apply. And basically, if you're a W-2 employee of your own corporation or LLC, you may, you may be eligible. So it's something worth looking into if you need to. Uh, each of your offices are going to have different situations, as I mentioned, so contact us to help uh, walk you through the maze and uh, realize that it may take some time for the dust to settle because there are lots of rules and regs that are still being generated. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. We have a couple of questions. I'm going to launch a poll real quick while you answer them. Um, first off, we have, do we need to file any paperwork to be reimbursed on the employee tax if we pay our employees during this downtime? If you uh, are paying the sick leave pay, that refund will be um, taken through the uh, payroll tax return. So there'll be an offset on the payroll tax return for your employer portion of FICA. You'll take the credit for what you paid. If the credit is, uh, exceeds that, then there should be a refund available on the return. And our next question is, if I applied for the SBA loan, would the forgiveness for payroll kick in for the existing pay period, which has affected me for a week and a half so far, or would it only kick in for future payroll after disbursement of the monies? Well, they've, they've stated that there's a period of March 1 to June 30th. And I, so I believe my understanding is that uh, if you've been paying payroll since March 1st, and we, obviously nobody's applying for a loan uh, before now because of the, the laws have just been changed. So my guess is that yes, it would be included for March 1. All right, it's good to be with everyone today. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. I uh, figure we all need a little humor. Uh, we're in a crap situation, so I figure if we could find something to help us treat it, that might be a little better. So uh, yeah, I hope you like this little uh, picture that my mom shared with us. I have another one I'll share in a little while, but uh, I'm gonna talk real quick about some SBA loan options. Um, I'll briefly go through these and and uh, talk about them real quick, and then we'll shift a little bit on on what we can do to help other things we can do to help your business stay strong during this difficult time. Um, there are three different SBA loan options uh, that you have available that hopefully will have available to you very soon. The first one is the small business interruption loans. These are the new ones that. Uh, we hope to get past here in the next day or so. Um, this one, well, I'll get into more detail. The next one is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. That's been around for a long, long time. And then the SBA Express Bridge Loans. So I'll go into some details on all of those. So if I can get this to work. So for the small business interruption loans, um, this is eligible for small businesses with under 500 employees, which I'm assuming all of you would would be eligible for this. And you can apply for this anytime March 1st through, Mar through December 31st this year. Um, I'm sure, sure none of you have needed to or have applied for it March 1st yet. So, um, but that's the dates they set forward. Um, the amount of your eligibility is, is based on things that you paid for your property. Or any mortgage payments, whether it's uh, for your practice or on your building, uh, if you own the building, uh, any rent payments, including rent under a lease agreement, payments on any other debt obligations. And then you take what you paid for for that year uh, and multiply it by four. And whatever that number is, if you spent, you know, if all those things cost you $100,000. Uh, you'd be eligible for a loan of $400,000 uh, or up to $10 million, but hopefully we don't have to go that high. Uh, you're allowed to use it for all the same types of things, payroll support, even if it's for paid sick medical or FMLA leave, anything that has to do with healthcare benefits for those people during that time. 
employee salaries, mortgage and rent payments, utilities, and any other obligation that was incurred before uh, the covered period, so before March 1st. Uh, there is some information on these for loan forgiveness. Uh, there were not very many de details in the uh, in the uh, in what I read in the Senate package that uh, explained how this loan forgiveness would work. Uh, it did say though it would be equivalent to the amount that you could receive in a loan benefit that you could use as as forgiveness, kind of wipe it clear and 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 go from there. So there's more information that should come out on that. Also, prepayment penalties. Typically with SBA loans, there are prepayment penalties, but if you would like to start paying on these loans, if you do get one, uh, most payments won't start until January 2021. You are allowed to start making payments before then if you would like. Uh, the other type of SBA loan that, that could benefit you is, is one that's been around for a while, this Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Um, they provide pretty low interest rates. Uh, these are to be used as working capital type loans to help you uh, forward your business and you can be loaned up to $2 million. Um, another type of loan is called the SBA Express Bridge Loan. And this loan is, is used to bridge the gap between applying for either the, the economic impact loan or the small business interruption loan. You can get up to $25,000 and they essentially just uh, deduct that amount from your overall proceeds of your loans. So this is just a short term to get you by until your loan gets funded. So, um, and th those are the different types of SBA loan products that, that are available for this type of uh, uh, circumstance. Um, now, future loan needs, what are we gonna do with your existing practice or, and or real estate loan? You need to contact your lender right away find out what they are willing to do for you. Most of them, if not all of them, should have something in place already uh, so that you can find some relief. Um, a lot of them, it will be, you know, not making any payments for three to six months and then making those payments in full at the end of that period. Or the more popular option is not making payments for several months and then restructuring your existing loan to include that amount on the back end of loan. So if you only had four years remaining on your practice loan, it add it by four years and six months or however long you need, needed to extend that. A business line of credit, moving forward, uh, Stephen talked about this earlier, it's good for you to have a line of credit for your business. I hope you don't ever have to use it. I would never recommend you using it. Uh, but it is good to have in case of uh, stressful times to be able to to meet some of your obligations. So I would I would look into some options uh, when it makes sense for you. To apply for any of these, the best way is to, to go to disasterloan.sba.gov. I believe they will continue to use that same uh, web address for all of their loan applications for, of, of these types. So. Um, that's what I have so far on the on the SBA stuff. I'm going to end this. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second so we can. I don't know if there's any questions. Looks like if you have a business line of credit, should you pull the money down and put it in your account? Um, that's a very good question. I was in the banking industry. Go from. 1999 till 2015 and when the market crashed back in 2008 there were a lot of institutions that were reducing or canceling these open lines of credit um, i would check with your institution see if they have any plans i it can't hurt to pull the money out leave it in your account um but <laughs> Uh, then it's just a game of either paying interest on it and keeping that money in your pocket and having to pay it back over time. I guess if you don't use it, then you can pay it all back. Uh, that, that's up to you. But I, 
I think either way, if, if you feel confident that, uh, that you'll be able to make those loan payments, then yeah, go ahead and pull it out. Uh, but if you don't need it right away, I would, I would just sit on it and wait until, wait, wait until you really need it. I hope that helps. Um, the other question that came through, uh, the EIDL loan on the SBA website is the only thing that's available right now because the other loan hasn't quite been approved. So I'm sure that once they approve it, it'll all go through the same website. So I would, personally, I would wait for the business interruption loan. So I would hold off, wait for them to pass the bill um, and go from there. So I think that's the better option personally. I hope that answered that question as well. <laughs> um, the other question, is there potential for loan forgiveness for existing SBA loans I may already have? Um, I believe there is. Uh, it was hard to figure out from the wording in the bill uh, if it was going to, uh, to work for old loans, but I believe that's what it was intended for was if, if you do have an existing SBA loan and you could also apply for this business interruption loan, and say you were applying for $100,000 and you still owed $100,000 on your SBA loan, I believe it would just cancel each other out. But there, there is more uh, information we need on that. So I, I don't feel confident in telling you exactly what, uh, what would happen there, but I believe they would just cancel each other out. Um, the, we won't know exactly what to do on that. Uh, loan forgiveness until they pass it through the house. And then once it's passed, we should be able to get more detail. So I hope that was helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, are you going to switch over to the other Yeah, one? I'll start the other one now. So let's, uh, okay, one more little bit of humor for me because I like a lot of humor, you know. When grandma hears you run out of toilet paper, that's probably what's going to happen. So be prepared. <clears throat> Just don't actually flush it. So I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about ways to improve your business while, while we're not working. Um, there are a lot of different things you could do. I'm, I'm trying to focus on a few basic things. I don't want to overwhelm you, but everyone's business, I don't care how well you run your practice. We all can improve in some ways. So I'll talk about a few different things. I'm going to talk about uh, these three main topics, training, whether it's uh, training for yourself or your team, uh, improving some business operations and, and uh, communication. Um, communication and training are two of the biggest downfalls in dental practices that I've seen over the last four and a half, five years. And so we'll talk about that. So starting on training your team, it's extremely important to have team and department meetings. Some of you might not have a team large enough to justify doing department meetings. If you only have one or two assistants, uh, one hygienist, one or two people up front at the, at the front desk, it might not make sense. But make sure you have at least a monthly team or staff meeting. It's important that you get together with everyone, find out what, uh, what challenges they might be having in the practice, find out what things are going well, create an action plan, and most definitely follow through. You've got to be good at following through with the, uh, with the different things that you uh, um, But make sure you set a meeting schedule. Plan your meetings in advance. Stick to the schedule. Don't let your patients force you to make changes. Um, you don't need to have big productions as a, as a meeting, but get together, talk about things from last month, talk about important things that need to happen in your, in your practice to improve. Talk about goals. Um, the next, next thing we need to work on with training our team, morning huddles. I don't know how many of you do a morning huddle, but this is an extremely important meeting. And usually the biggest obstacle in having effective morning huddles is the fact that the dentist doesn't show up to work on time. Uh, if you can be there 10 to, 15, 10 to 15 minutes before your first patient, that gives you more than enough time to have an effective morning huddle. Morning huddles should be no longer than 10 minutes. Talk about how things went yesterday. 
What did we do well? What can we improve on? You know, what new patients do we have coming into the practice today? We need to make sure we pay special attention to them and, and make sure they have a great experience. Are there any patient needs for that day? Is there anyone that's coming in that we should target for uh, online reviews or asking for referrals? How are we progressing as a team toward our goals for our practice? These are things that, are, that we can talk about each day to make sure everyone's on the same page and, and to, to motivate everyone moving forward. And then another part is cross-training your team. It's so important to make sure, especially in times like this where we're realistically for the foreseeable future going to be operating on a reduced team. You're not gonna have as many employees working with you from day to day until, the, until we're given the all clear to resume business as usual. It's important to make sure that everyone can do everyone else's job as much as possible. It might not be realistic to have all of your assistants or your hygienists learn how to, to submit insurance claims, but maybe it does, maybe it makes sense. So figure out what would work best for your, for your practice moving forward and cross train your team as much as possible. If, if you still have your team employed, cross train now now would be a great time to get them learning how to do other other things within the practice um, training your team is so important there was a survey done of 2,000 dental practices across the country and of those practices they were asked how often they train their team one and a half percent train their team on a monthly basis another one and a half percent on an annual basis that's 3% of that, those 2,000 practices were receiving any, any kind of training throughout the year. Take time to train. Um, a couple things to improve your business operations. Uh, Stephen talked about this earlier. When you need to make sure that you've always got a, a reserve account that has enough money to cover two to three months worth of expenses. Um, this is my number one recommendation to to all the dental business owners this is what you need uh, and, and you can choose whether or not to include what you're paying yourself as well might as well might as well build that reserve account so that you can the hard part is is a lot of of uh, single dentist practices where you're the owner dentist a lot of a lot of dentists i've come across they treat their business bank account like their personal bank account um, so another thing that's important to do is start paying yourself based on your individual, your personal collections. General rule of thumb is that if you had an associate, you're going to pay them 30% of their collections. Well, you should do the same for yourself. 30% of collections is a great number. Anything above and beyond that will go to your bottom line and you'll be able to take home in profits moving forward. But be strict with that. Pay yourself based on only what you are actually earning by working. And then later on, you'll be able to pay yourself, you'll be able to use the excess to, to build your reserves and then pay yourself through your profits as well. I think it's extremely important to study your profit and loss statement every month. Uh, get to know what's on there. How much money are you spending in different categories? Are you spending way too much on your office supplies or your dental supplies? Dental supplies is a big, uh, a big issue here, especially in Utah. We pay too much for our supplies here. Let's review it, make sure that uh, we're keeping our costs as low as possible. How much are we paying our team? Is that going up over the years? The percentage that you pay your should stay the same year over year and, and hopefully decrease the larger you become. But reviewing your profit and loss monthly, uh, making sure your expenses are in line will be very beneficial to you moving forward. Um, if you're not sure how to reduce some of your overhead, let us know. We can help you do that. I've spent a lot of time helping reduce overhead and giving ideas for how to do that. So just let us know. And then what are some of your big pain points in your practice? I know each of you that owns a practice, there are things that just drive you crazy. And unfortunately, being the clinician, being the main producer in, in, your, in your practice, you don't have time to deal with all of the different issues. So Figure out what those are and work on them now. You know, take time to evaluate and to fix these issues. Um, and then implement better systems. We can always improve what we're doing. Um, everyone has a great system for 
uh, for collecting, but can it be better? Everyone has a great system for uh, onboarding new patients, but can it be better? Can it be more efficient? Talk to your team, find out what systems need to improve uh, to help your office run more efficiently. Um, that it can only help moving forward. And now that you have the time, now's the time to do it. Finally, let's talk about communication. So important right now to communicate with your team, whether you've uh, laid them off or furloughed them in hopes to rehire them when you can open your doors again and, and, and uh, work business as usual, communicate with them. Um, stay positive. All of your communication should be positive. Let them know how much you care about them, how you appreciate them. Keep them informed on, on what plans you're making moving forward or, or what the outlook looks like. And be understanding of their personal situations. We are in a very interesting time, very uh, unique needs that your, your team might have, very understanding. And then with your patients, stay connected to them. If you, if you connect through social media or email or newsletter already, keep doing it. Keep your conversations with them positive. Um, help them know how much you appreciate having them as a patient. And uh, also, we don't know when you're going to be able to start business as usual, so keep sending out your reminders to your patients for upcoming appointments. And then as we find, if we find out closures need to last longer, then let them know that we'll need to reschedule their, their patient or their appointment. But I would hate to have you uh, have a completely bare schedule when you're able to open your doors again, and have to start calling everyone. So keep, keep them on the books and keep them informed as to what's going on. So um, that's all I have for now. Um, I guess I'll stop sharing this and I'm curious if there's any questions. Uh, there was a question uh, from Jeremy White. Could you review pros and cons of paying employees versus having them file for unemployment? Costs, time delay, penalties, how long it takes to recoup costs, et cetera. Ed, I think that might be best for you to answer. I mean, from a, from a cash flow perspective, um, unemployment's going to provide, you know, cash flow to your employee that you don't have to provide. Um, now, Rates are probably going to go up a little bit in the future, but when you look at uh, the offset, I think you're better off having them on unemployment, especially with the federal subsidy coming in, than uh, than paying them yourself. Let's see. I can't see that question. Is there any more that I can answer on that? Uh, no, you've got it. Um... Any, anything else to add, Stephen or Brandon? No. That one's, that one's just tough because the last thing you want to do is, is keep paying your team if you don't have money coming into your practice. But at the same time, it'd be nice to keep them and keep them engaged and doing things in your practice. It's just uh, – yeah, it's, it's a tough situation. It might be in your best interest to let them collect the unemployment and uh, send out messages to them, do some remote uh, you know, email. Well, or, gonna, or... Go ahead. It's Ed. not an even more question here because they are allowing unemployment even if they're getting partial pay. So they really need to, uh, I mean, you can kind of get the best of both worlds, maybe still do some training, have some communications with your team, have them doing things in the office and then still getting them paid unemployment for the time they're not there. Okay. Um, any final questions? Okay. It looks like that is it. Um, we do have some events coming up um, that I would love to share with you guys. Um, and we are doing a webinar next week. Um, this was scheduled before the whole coronavirus situation even um, was a thing. <laughs> um, but we're, we're probably going to have some updates um, once this, the new bill passes through the house at that webinar. Um, so please um, make sure to make sure to uh, join us at that um, meeting next week. Um, what if you have employees that are coming in for some hours? Unemployment takes into unemployment takes that into account. 
So, um, Ed, can you confirm? I think that's what you were saying. Yes, they would get a reduced benefit based on hours that are being compensated by the by the business. So there'd be a there'd be an allocation there. Okay. Um, so again, hopefully you will join us next week. If not, um, follow those links um, on your left hand side to um, maybe schedule an appointment with us, um, or you can find us on. LinkedIn under Drill Down Solution or on Facebook at uh, Drill Down Solution, all one word. Um, and we are also doing a um, dental master class beginning in June. Um, we are excited uh, to launch the dental business master class this summer. We're looking for 16 progressive dental practices who want to build super efficient teams and profitable businesses. The masterclass will be designed to increase your annual production by $200,000, increase your profit and take home pay, and help you maintain a great work-life balance. If you're interested in joining the masterclass, um, follow that link that I put in the chat uh, to schedule an appointment to talk to us about that. Oh, hold on just a second. Looks like Jeremy has a question. Oh. Can we let Jeremy talk? Yep, we can let Jeremy talk. Okay, go ahead, Jeremy. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. All right. So um, some of my employees, if they use their vacation pay during this time, does that, does that reduce their ability to um, take out unemployment benefits? What, is there like a threshold they have to stay under for amount of hours and all that? Well, uh, under the old rules, if they had any compensation for a week, for that particular week, then they would not get unemployment compensation. Um, generally, the idea is that if the business is paying them, then unemployment's not going to pay them. So I don't know where, where vacation is elective. Uh, I don't know whether they can say, I'm going to take 10 hours of vacation this week and still get unemployment. I'm not sure, honestly, how that's going to work. That's a question we'd have to ask. Uh, but I do know that the employees every week need to report in, uh, say what their compensation has been and what their activity has been for the last week, and that determines uh, the level of the benefit for that particular week. Okay, I see. All right. I had, I had initially told my employees that I was going to – pay them at least two days in addition to the trainings we've been holding just to kind of keep them going. Um, should I back off on that, um, that strategy? Uh, I don't know well, where, if I've caught myself in a tough situation there. I think it might be interesting to, to do that. Well, you've already been doing it. So let them make some unemployment claims for those weeks and see how they, how the formulas work out for them. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thanks for the course. That was great. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. And, you know, as, as ever, we all know, things are changing on a daily basis, even multiple times a day. Um, so we're trying to um, keep up to date on everything and we'll, we'll continue to disseminate information as we get it. Um, looks like that is it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, you can reach us at uh, info at drilldownsolution.com. And uh, we hope to see you on our next webinar. Thank you and have a wonderful, wonderful day.